Keith Wallace, of course, is very dear to all of us, is the founder of MIU. But I think also, I always wonder, what was his first aha experience when he discovered this fourth major state of consciousness and began to explore it as, as a, its own distinct state of physiology? It must have been absolutely fascinating. I'm hoping he's going to share that with us this afternoon. And as well as Fred Travis, who's really opened up a window into our mind to see the EEG signatures. So they're going to be talking about today the neurophysiology of peak performance. Please welcome Keith Wallace and Fred Travis. I'd like to start with a little story. In 1974, I went to India to speak at an international congress. I'd only had my PhD for four years, but I was speaking to a group of about a thousand of the top physiologists around the world. And it was a little bit, uh, I was a little bit nervous, I must say. But the interesting thing was that before I went to this conference, I spent, uh, in fact, I stayed up the whole night before, several nights before, working with Maharishi on developing uh, this speech. So I was very well prepared. And Maharishi called this speech the Neurophysiology of Enlightenment. And it was interesting because of one of the top scientists in India, he essentially was hosting the conference, and so he felt this was appropriate. Even though I was a young PhD, he thought this was amazing that here was this great research that spoke about the tradition of India. And so that's why he made me probably the main speaker of this whole conference. And as I was preparing, and literally we prepared all night, um, Marshy said, oh, we're going to make a pamphlet for you. I said, Marshy, you know, this is a scientific conference. I can't go with a pamphlet. They won't understand. You don't do that at science. He said, no, no, no. We're going to do that. And we're going to put your picture in it, too. <laughs> so, you know, before the lecture, all these pamphlets were handed out to all these scientists. And, you know... I had my thesis advisor, I had my whole you know, board there, all my, all my teachers in that audience, along with another thousand other people who managed to get this little pamphlet here, the Neurophysiology of Enlightenment, with a picture of me, which you know, I did look quite young at that time. People sort of looked around me, Dr. Wallace? Oh yeah, yeah, where are you? you know? But it was beautiful what Maharishi had done in this pamphlet. It was exquisite. I'll just read you just a few parts. He said, Enlightenment is not a hypnotic state of self-delusion or self-denial. The state of enlightenment represents the ultimate development of what we ordinarily consider to be the most valuable qualities of life. Very a beautiful definition of enlightenment. It is something real, natural and tangible, and develop systematically in a continuous and progressive manner on the basis of neurophysiological refinement or purification. And this is the main point I just wanted to make, because no one ever had defined enlightenment that way in the world. That was Maharishi's genius to first of all encourage scientific research. You know, there had been some studies, people had looked at yogis, they looked at, you know, they dug a pit, put a yogi in it, and saw how long he could survive. I mean, that was literally <laughs> the extent of the research. And there was some, you know, he did survive, so it was okay. But, um, and his ox consumption seemed to go down. Um, and then, you know, there were studies in Japan where they looked at very, very expert people, 30, 40 years experience, and they would see certain changes. But again, that was kind of phenomenalistic. Nobody was really interested in explaining what was happening. And Maharishi came out right away to the world, and he said, enlightenment is based on neurophysiological refinement. And with that, some five million people started meditation and pursued enlightenment. Maybe they were interested in lowering their blood pressure, doing this or that. But nevertheless, never in the history of the world had five million householders suddenly pursued enlightenment 
all because Maharishi redefined it. And of course, he brought out an exquisite technique to allow it to be brought about. But he talked about enlightenment in the language of the times. And that was really Maharishi's great genius. He understood that the experience of consciousness, of pure consciousness, changed the nervous system. Now, the research hadn't even been done to explain that yet, but Maharishi understood that very clearly. I remember in one lecture he said, what will be that experience that will enliven the nervous system but not create stress in it? What would be that one perfect experience? And he said it would be bliss consciousness, pure consciousness. And this, we now understand on a neurophysiological basis that everything we do, right now you're hearing this lecture, neurons are changing in your brain. It's dynamic, our brain. It's not hardwired. It's constantly changed by experience. But we've never had that experience of transcending before. Suddenly, Maharishi introduces the experience of transcending, boom, right away. And you could see, for me, doing the research in the early days was easy because I could take beginners in and instantly you'd see these beautiful changes, nice, lovely alpha waves in the frontal part of their brain, all kinds of changes in their physiology from biochemical changes, oxygen consumption, and so forth. And I submitted my first paper before I was, even had my PhD. A graduate student said to me, well, you know, why don't you just publish this? I said, well, I haven't even done my thesis yet. I mean, I've just done this preliminary research. He said, no, no, it's fine. You can publish it in this magazine. Turns out that magazine, Science, is a magazine that <laughs> any scientist in their lifetime, if they even got close to it, would be happy. I had no idea. Didn't have my PhD, submitted this article, and the, the article is so snobby that they wouldn't even put your credentials. They'd just put where you were from. So fortunately, nobody knew. I was still a PhD student, you know. <laughs> so this is how it happened, very innocently, very simply, based on Marshi changing the attitude for how we evaluate meditation. Not only giving us an incredible technique, but changing the whole paradigm of how we approach meditation. And he, instead of shifting the paradigm completely, he brought out a means by which we can include it in the present paradigm. We could understand meditation in a very mechanistic way. We have an experience of transcending, it's a new experience, the brain responds to a new experience, changes the brain, we see these changes in the um, EEG instantly, they happen when we're meditating, and I'm very fortunate to be with the leading researcher today in the field of brain research, Dr. Fred Travis, very dear friend and brilliant researcher, who's now taken this from my very early research many, many, many years ago, and taken it and shown in a very sophisticated way, really validating what Marshi said, that there is a progression that there is a neurophysiology of enlightenment. And as we go through these different stages of enlightenment, as we go through different stages of higher states of consciousness, we can track those changes in the brain. And I think the most interesting th finding he's going to tell you about is that most of the most powerful changes are outside of meditation. So it's my joy to ask Fred now to bring, bring out the latest research. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Keith, and thank you for establishing enlightenment on a very firm basis of brain functioning. A lot of things that happened since your research, some has looked at blood flow. What we see here is blood flow during TM practice, and we see that during TM, there's increased blood flow in the front part of your brain. That's your executive center. That's the source of planning. While there's decreased blood flow, decreased blood flow here, this is a primitive brain. This has to do with arousal, has to do with activation. What you're looking at is a blood flow pattern of restful alertness. Here's the rest for mind and body. Here we have the attentional levels. I'm much more awake. This pattern is unique to TM practice. Uh, we can understand meditations in different categories. Focus attention involves meditations that um, include voluntary, sustained attention on an object. It's focused attention. And when you're doing this type of process, what you see in your brain is increased gamma activity. It's a very fast functioning um, brainwave activity. It goes up 20 to 50 times per second. 
When you look at neural imaging, you see the whole brain is active. Concentration requires effort. Another category is open monitoring. In open monitoring, what you do is there's this passionate observation of changing experiences in the brain. It could be changing breath, changing body states, uh, changing mind. When you have your attention on internal processes, this is what you see. A brain wave is called theta 2. It's the upper band of theta. It goes up and down 68 times per second. And this is where it is primarily in the front. And where we see the change is in the part of the brain that has to do with attention switching, because you're constantly moving your attention from one thing to another. The last court category, automatic self-transcending, includes any meditation which goes beyond its procedures of practice. The self that's being transcended here is the steps of the meditation. And it leaves, it goes from thinking and you arrive to a state of being. And when you're having this experience of awareness just turn within, you see the lower level of the alpha band, alpha one, goes up and down eight to 10 times per second. And here we see this over the whole brain. And this is the change in blood flow pattern that we've just seen. Now this pattern of blood flow is also seen in terms of electrical activity. But before I get at that, I'd just like to take a broader view, and that is language allows us to symbolically represent the world. It's allowed us to create, to visualize and create this building. Language is what lets people envision the unified field. Also, language is what's used to create gen genetic modified organisms. What happens with the language is we can get stuck in the language, stuck in the words and the concepts, stuck in the world view, stuck in paradigms. Meditations in these first two categories continue us involved in the thinking process. With transcendental meditation, which is in this automatic self-transcending category, you're actually able to transcend thought. You're able to transcend categories. You're able to explore what is at the source of thought. And what is at the source of thought is just consciousness, pure consciousness without an object. I ask people to describe that experience. And I ask them to describe it in their own words, as though they're tasting a strawberry. I don't want them to give me the words they've heard me speak out. And then I did content analysis where you see what are the ideas contained in their descriptions. These are the three themes, absence of time, absence of space, and absence of body sense. Absence of time, that's the part of us which is eternal. Absence of body sense is the part of us which is connected with the world around us. This is our most universal self. This is the experience of transcendental consciousness, of just consciousness itself. It's the fourth state of consciousness. And we're fortunate that we, we not only have this experience during the meditation, but it becomes part of our daily activity. Here we have EEG patterns in a 19-year-old meditating for four months. This is TM practice. This is eyes open. Here we have the alpha activity we talked about. We see it goes up and down together. This is called coherence. Coherence means different part of the brain are working together. This is eyes open. You notice this fast activity. This is the gamma. This is the beta. This is actually trying to take in outside information. Keep your attention on this side of the slide because we'll see EEG patterns in someone meditating for eight years. Ready? Notice what's happening is the EEG patterns of TM are there now during waking activity. So what's happening is that universal sense of self, that part of us which is silent, stable, non-changing, is becoming part of everyday activity. This is cosmic consciousness. Maharshi says, we see things as before, but not as before. Now the inner state of being is lived. There's something added to your customary experience, and that's something that's not a thought, it's not a feeling, it's an inner continuum. This is how someone describes this experience during sleep. I'll let you read it. This person teaches school at the Maharshi School of the Age of Enlightenment, the K through 12 school, a consciousness-based school here in Fairfield. Notice they use a very concrete analogy to explain this very abstract experience. Pure consciousness is there, it's a continuum. It's like the soda which is always there. 
And the fizzing of the soda, which lets you identify with it, is like that effervescence of pure consciousness, which gives rise to thoughts and feelings and perceptions. But when that settles down, when you're asleep, it's as though the, the fizzing goes down. This is what's happening in the brain during this experience. It's 30 seconds of data. These are delta waves. That's what you see during sleep. That's restoration during sleep. This is someone reporting cosmic consciousness. Notice you still see the delta waves. You still see the restoration of sleep. But in addition, it's more ragged. Uh, we can count this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We see an eight hertz wave on top of a one hertz wave. We see these two frequencies, which correlate with deep sleep, delta, and inner wakefulness. This is what the group data show. And what's interesting, so this is non-meditators during sleep, short-term meditators during sleep, those reporting cosmic consciousness. Notice in the short-term meditators who are not experiencing cosmic consciousness, there's still a beginning of integration of this style of functioning into the brain. What is happening is CC isn't a zero-one step. It's like a flower opening up gradually over time. This is what the brain looks like in people who are engaged in activity. We have 17 non-meditating subjects, 17 practicing TM but not reporting CC, 17 reporting CC. We gave them complex computer tasks, and what's differentiated this group is what is the character of the front of the brain, these organizing executive centers of the brain. We see it's working more as a whole. Also, the overall dominant frequencies are more alpha, which is self-referral, and less of this fast activity, which is object referral. You're getting a different basis from which you're processing the world. And last, brain preparatory response. Notice we have a mirror image here. During a simple task, when you know the response, there's increased preparatory response. And the choice reaction time, where you don't have enough information, the people reporting CC are remaining balanced until it's time to act. And we've added these together to get a brain integration scale, uh, non-meditator, short-term, higher states. And what this is showing is there's now a different perspective on which you're appreciating the world. You have a completely different inner frame of reference. So because of that, uh, the brain integration scores correlate with more reasoning, higher emotional stability, just because this, the frame of reference from which you're living life has been transformed. This last slide is um, ongoing research seeing do we see this measure, this brain measure, any way else. This is work I've done with Harold Harung. He's been instrumental in creating and carrying out this research. Uh, we're right now writing a book which is uh, reporting our research. This is just looking at the brain patterns. We see in athletes, and these are 66 athletes, 33 had um, finished in the top 10 for at least three consecutive years in Olympic Games, National Games, the controls had not. You notice there's higher levels of brain integration. Managers, we see a similar phenomena. These are top level managers. They've been CEOs for 18 years or longer. Uh, the company had grown during that time. We see higher levels of brain integration compared with controls. Now these are not meditation studies. They didn't practice meditation, but they are successful. Here we have brain integration in our short-term, long-term practitioners. Now when I show this, I don't mean to suggest that if you meditate, you're going to be a great manager and a great athlete. But what I do suggest is transcending, taking the mind to inner unboundedness, is creating that brain style which is going to make you more successful in whichever area of life you're endeavoring. So my conclusion, the brain changes as we grow to cosmic consciousness. As the brain changes, we realize our birthright to live universal being in the midst of waves of change. To live this reality is why we have been born on earth. What transcending is going to do is it's going to take the conscious future and it's going to make it into our living presence. Thank you very much. Can we both stand up here? Okay.